Good morning and welcome everyone to um, this morning's seminar. My name is Christina Anastasi and I am the Acting Chief of Division of the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here in Geoscience Australia and I'm pleased to be opening the seminar. Um, but before we begin, on behalf of myself and Geoscience Australia, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country throughout Australia we are meeting on this morning and I also acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Look, I'm standing here and I'm actually very excited and pleased to be here in person um, and welcoming you all to this Wednesday Seminar for Earth Science Week 2023. I'm sure everyone here is, everyone online, and I know everyone here in front of me is just as excited as I am. Communicating our science is an important goal for us um, this week, so we are pleased this morning to present a case study on this very topic. The case study, Communicating Multidisciplinary Geoscience, Lessons from the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program is going to be presented to you today by Dr Saleh McAlpine. Communicating with integrity is fundamental to building trust in geoscience. This talk explores the importance of successful geoscience communication through examples and lessons from the recently completed Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program. Um, we call it the TEGI program because that is really quite a mouthful. Um, the TEGI program developed a repository of the latest baseline data and information on geology, resources, groundwater, surface water and the environment for four basin regions, those being the North Bowen, Galilee, Cooper and Attervale. The repository itself is designed to provide Australian governments, industries and communities with the highest quality data and information that is available for these basin regions, which helps to enable faster evidence-based decisions and providing better outcomes for the environment. Um, before I ask Sanlay to join us, I'll give you a bit of an overview about our speaker. Now, Dr McAlpine is our senior, senior advisor for Critical Minerals and the Director of Strategy and Analysis in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. Prior to her current role, Saleh led the implementation of the TEGI program. Saleh has completed her PhD in Earth Science at the Australian National University in 2015 and her career has focused on integration and communication of multidisciplinary geoscience international science engagement and pre-competitive geoscience research for over 10 years with the Australian Government. And now I'd like you all to welcome Saleh to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone. Happy Earth Science Week. It's a privilege to be standing in front of you today, celebrating the greatest of the sciences. For those of you who aren't aware, each year there is a theme for this week. And this year it is Geoscience, Innovating for Earth and People. An exploration of the many ways that Earth science innovations benefit people and the planet. I put up some text from the American Geoscience Institute, including a quote from the executive director, Jonathan Arthur. But what I'd particularly like to draw your attention to are two things about this week's celebration that are appropriate for today's presentation. Firstly, that geoscience is playing a growing role in society and the benefits to people and planet need to go hand in hand. Secondly, this week is an opportunity to engage in responsible stewardship of the earth, a role we all play here in this room. And this concept of stewardship is one that I'll come back to as I explore the importance of good communication and trust in science. The title of my talk today is Communicating Multidisciplinary Geoscience, but the vehicle that we're all going to ride in today is that of the recently delivered Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program, 
Teggy. Thanks, Christina. And I think that this is a pretty good case study for communicating complex geoscience. I'm looking forward to sharing with you what this program was all about, the integrated nature of the science, our approach as a team, the outreach and communication associated, and some of the many lessons we learned along the way. It's very important to me to share with you that science communication is not my area of expertise. My doctorate was in mantle petrology, and my current role, as Christina shared with you, is as a director in the advice, investment, attraction and analysis branch, and the theme particularly around critical minerals. So you can consider me a scientist who is trying her very best to deliver high quality science and advice for a variety of audiences to make evidence for informed decisions. Hopefully good evidence informed decisions, but that's subjective and in respect of Earth Science Week, I'm going to remain objective today. The science that I enjoy as an employee of Geoscience Australia has the beauty of spanning from mineral to continental scale. And I want to pause here to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia. Their continuing connection to country, their con continuing connection to land, water and community. I do not take this acknowledgement slide lightly, nor did the team as part of the TEGI program. Because the study I'm about to share with you was actually a desktop study. You can interpret that as a study that we could have done from the comfort of our offices. But to get input into our scientific program, to share our findings, to get feedback and improve our practice, we tried hard to get in touch with the people who live, work and rely on the geographical regions we were researching. So I extend this acknowledgement to the First Nations people who we connected with during the program. The Baradabana, Bidjara, Bunfamara, Janga, Koa, Kuma, Mayawali, Mythika, Dieri, and Wankamara people, and all of the other traditional custodians of the lands we studied. Now the program itself. This was an 18 month program that the Department of Industry, Science and Resources engaged to Geoscience Australia to deliver. To deliver better data for geological basin regions. The program was also supported by the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and, and Water. And there are three points I would like to make about the nature of the program. We achieved this program through collaboration with CSIRO. And this was a fantastic opportunity to integrate geosciences expertise in geology, resources and groundwater with the environmental expertise of CSIRO in surface water and ecology. The pairing of our two institutions was a strength of this program and it took what could have been a more traditional geological basin study to a science program that explored the interconnected nature of a geological basin from the stratigraphy through to the flora and fauna of the region. The data, information and tools delivered by this program are intended to improve the understanding of baseline conditions across each of the basins we investigated. And we really focused on the program, the program on user needs. The program outputs are informed by stakeholder advice and the advice of First Nations people with formal ac engagement activities undertaken, the formation of a basin reference group, as well as workshops to inform what hazards can be related to extractive industries and associated geological activity through to, the as through to the assets that may be impacted. Birds, grasses, trees. A focus on communication and engagement was to ensure that we delivered information and data that is useful, usable and used. This is a multidisciplinary program, as the title of the talk suggests, and we collated and analysed data and information pertaining to hydrogen, petroleum, geological storage of carbon, minerals, surface water, groundwater and the environment. For each basin region under study, 
we collated the current state of knowledge for the discipline areas I've just mentioned, as well as undertaken geological resource assessments to understand the geological potential for hydrogen generation, conventional and unconventional hydrocarbons, and geological storage of carbon. This is to ensure we understand where de resource development is most likely, which in turn informs the environmental assessments to understand the potential impacts and hazards associated with any resource development. All of the work of the program is freely available now <laughs> and has been available, but has been made available through a baseline data rep repository hosted on the Geoscience Australia website. There is a link on this slide, um, and I can see you all scrambling to get your pens, but don't worry, um, I'll pop it up on the final slide too. Luckily, I wasn't doing this work alone. This is a list of the Geoscience Australia team that worked across the various stages of the program. I mean, just pause, what excellence on this slide. But it was not just the high calibre of the team. It was the way they worked together to integrate their specific areas of expertise that really made this program a success. Each scientific discipline leader was also the representative and spokesperson for their science, which gave our stakeholders unique access to the scientists, which was a specific request made at the start of this program. So these are the basin locations that this program has focused on. The Cooper, Ada Vale, Galilee, and North Bowen Basins. Predominantly within the state of Queensland, with the Cooper Basin extending into South Australia and a tiny bit into New South Wales. But I need you to think in 3D for a minute, because these basins have overlying geology. And this study also includes these overlying basins. For example, the Eremanga, represented by the brown box. And at the top of the image, the light blue boxes representing the Lake Eyre Basin. This is a conceptualisation, obviously, where we have represented the basins as stacked boxes. This is a figure which we lovingly refer to as boxy. And when you're a scientist trying to be a science communicator, you just do your best. <laughs> but no matter where the, located, where the basin is located geographically or at depth, these were some of the fundamental aims of the program. To improve the understanding of potential hazards, risks and impacts of resources development. Streamline development whilst meeting the needs of the environment. Deliver data, information and tools to support and optimise environmental regulation. Now, I'd like to share some of the scientific findings. But prepare yourself because I'm going to deliberately go through these next slides very fast. I will be showing you examples of the resource assessments, maps of known resources, groundwater conceptualisations, surface water and ecology data, to give you a sense of the breadth of information that has been compiled for each of the basin regions. On screen is my first example of a resource assessment. The green on these maps, including this one, represents high potential. So in this case, high hydrogen generation potential. And where the colours are red, it's lower. So to assess potential for resources in a basin region, Geoscience Australia is using the play-based exploration workflow that has been developed and refined by the petroleum industry over several decades. For those of, for those of you interested in this play-based workflow, I'm probably going to go through this a little too fast, but it involves a systematic evaluation of the key risk elements for each play interval through a well failure analysis and play fairway mapping. So the petroleum geologists in the room, you know, get excited, everyone else, just, just take a pause. And these are to produce a common risk segment or play, play fairway map. In adopting this methodology and applying it to the regional scale, we aim to develop a nationally consistent approach for assessing the yet to find resources um, in, in sediment hosted systems, with a particular focus on producing spatially enabled prospectivity assessments of future energy resources, including hydrogen. So the example on the screen is for green hydrogen or hydrogen generated from renewable sources. And this is a map for the Cooper Basin. 
It takes into account groundwater availability, salinity and potential aquifer yield, as well as the renewable energy potential across the basin region. This is an example of a resource assessment for hot conventional hydrocarbons. This is in the North Bowen Basin and the key elements mapped um, and evaluated are listed on the slide. This is an example of a resource assessment map for unconventional hydrocarbons, also in the North Bowen Basin, and also with the key elements evaluated on the slide. So when you think of unconventional hydrocarbons, many people just go straight to coal seam gas, and that's why the terminology is used on the slide here. Supporting the Australian government's commitments of net zero by 2050, the geological storage of carbon dioxide has also been assessed with the purpose of storing captured carbon dioxide safely underground, typically in saline groundwater. The example here is the assessment result for the Galilee Basin. This map is an overlay of known mineral resources. This is an example of the known mineral deposits in the Galilee. And for those of you who are getting excited about all things critical minerals, you will see the Julia Creek vanadium deposit in the northwest of this basin region. This slide shows something new, the groundwater assessment for the Adavale Basin and overlying basins. The work undertaken by the groundwater experts include the creation of conceptual models. And this example is a cross section, roughly southwest to northeast across the Adavale Basin. It shows the stacked nature of the basins that we were assessing. And the colors on this slide are blue, representing aquifers, and brown representing aquitards, with the yellow lines on the image showing the contact between the Galilee and the Aramanka, and then the deeper contact between the Galilee and the Adavale Basin. Groundwater data available includes salinity and groundwater pressure, which has relevance for a number of users. Agriculture, mining and development, town supply, but this information also has an important use in understanding groundwater as an asset to protect and manage sustainably. This is an example of groundwater salinity mapped for a single, single aquifer, the Winton Macunda. This is within the Adavale Basin. The patchy nature of the map simply indicates the mapped extent of the aquifer in this region, which is also useful information in its own right. The blues in this map are the colours that relate to the salinity range appropriate for human use. Here is an example of surface water information. On this map you can see precipitation minus evapotranspiration and the mean annual stream flows all across the North Bowen Basin. Particularly useful for stakeholders managing changing surface water availability. This is an example of the mapped ecology over the Galilee Basin. You can see the bioregions represented in the different colours, including the Mitchell Grass Downs and the Desert Uplands, all of which have unique flora and fauna. And these environmental assets are many. This map shows hotspots of where they are up to, there are up to greater than 25 priority assets in the Galilee region. And these assets could be birds, grasses, trees. The species included in the assessment are both state and Commonwealth listed species, and there are 116 identified ac across this program region. Now, I'm not expecting you to see anything on this slide, but I am expecting you to be wowed by it <laughs> because it gives you a taste of all of the ways this science can connect. It's an example of a causal network developed by CSIRO, which integrates the information from resource type and development all the way through to the environmental assets which may be impacted. All of the boxes and connecting lines represent a flow of information from the driver, which in this case is the development of a particular resource, which then has related activities, stresses, processes, and finally assets that can be impacted.
time out. I don't think that was a very good example of good scientific communication. And it was actually only a few examples of what was produced over our 18-month program. There is simply so much to consume. But what was the purpose of racing through all of that information? One, a little bit to show off, but really, in a true and simple sense, it was to show you the nature of the communication challenge, the complexity and diversity of the science across a very large geographical area. A slightly more meaningful question that this prompts is what does success actually look like? Is throwing all of this data out into the world, free of charge, yay, enough? Well, no. We do need to produce high quality data and information. But in my opinion, this high quality information then needs to be used in decision making by community, local, state, federal government. We need this high quality, freely available, pre-competitive data to lead to evidence-focused decisions. And to ensure this measure of success, we cannot rely on the quality of science alone. You can see where this is going because the words are on the slide, but it has to be well communicated. I mean, we've got the goods. The TEGI program has something for everyone. It spans a beautiful breadth of science. It assesses a geological basin as a whole Earth science ecosystem. But this is spatial map-based information, and all science happens somewhere. This is someone's land on someone's country, and we better start talking to people. I now introduce you to the Basin Reference Group. The TEGI program actively engaged with communities, First Nations people, business and government stakeholders across the Basin regions. To do this, a Basin Reference Group was formed. This engagement meant that the program actively listened to and sought to address the needs of those who live, work in and rely on the regions being studied. Communication through the Basin Reference Group offered a unique opportunity to ensure all affected stakeholders and First Nations group have equal access to and understanding of the data and information and the tools being produced by the Commonwealth Government and how to benefit from them. And each interested party has a different need for the same information. Communicating this takes time. We sure didn't go through the available information as quickly as I did with you today, although we were tempted to, and we did get better as time went on. But direct engagement with those that can benefit from this information supports data equality, so it was important to get right. Each individual or, gr or group of people is given the same resources freely available. The Basin Reference Group has broad membership that includes representatives from Commonwealth, state, and local government, industry representatives, energy, minerals, and relevant regional industry, First Nations groups, peak bodies, local water users, and natural resource management bodies. The group meetings provided stakeholders and First Nations people with a forum to ensure that TEGI delivers for them. And we had six meetings over the 18-month program. The last three were combined in the form of a roadshow when we visited Longreach, Charleville and Rockhampton. And the importance of getting out into community was made very clear. But there are other reasons communication is important. In an era of misinformation and scepticism towards both science and government, we're facing a little bit of a challenge. And being an effective science steward demands clear communication. We must translate complex concepts into accessible language, fostering public understanding and trust whilst also providing this reliable, freely available scientific source. And to add to the challenge, we had the word trusted in our program title. So we had to be able to answer the question regularly about what makes this environmental and geological information trusted more than once in this program. I can give you the quick answer though following rigorous scientific process, having a thorough internal and external peer review, testing results with the Basin Reference Group, 
making the work transparent and freely available. These were some of the, the ways we answered this question. Because it is important to be able to try to answer the questions to the best of your ability. During the program, we had a high performing intern from ANU join us. Her name was Rosie Bauer. And we set her the task of predictively mapping the social impacts of the TEGI program and generating recommendations on how to measure and improve social impact. She found that the anticipated social impacts of the program included improvement of government social licence to operate, primarily due to social licence being built through transparency, access to information and genuine engagement to build relationships, a positive reinforcing loop with higher levels of trust leading to better program delivery, increasing the social licence, therefore contributing to the social impacts of other government programs which are more directly targeted at social welfare, more government programs being co-designed with First Nations people in particular, leading to more effective program delivery, and increased resource development, which could improve the provision of infrastructure, schools, parks, roads, also having a positive long-term effect on socioeconomic wellbeing. The provision of pre-competitive data and resource assessments also allows industry to undertake more targeted exploration for resources reducing the impact on the natural environment and maintaining a, a community's nature connectedness. So how did we communicate? The word integrity is a really big word and it's one I use cautiously because when you're standing up on a podium and you're saying it's really important to communicate with integrity, I then have to demonstrate that in the next, you know, 12 to 13 slides. But it is a genuine driver for how we attempted to communicate in the program in a way that was honest, transparent and principled. Because communicating with integrity, as you will well know, is the way to build trust and the foundation of strong relationships. And it's essential in our role as government scientists and public servants. The people we communicate with, internal and external to government, rely on us to provide accurate, up-to-date information act in their best interests and make well-informed decisions. Or, in this case, provide reliable information for others to make well-informed decisions. But effective communication is a two-way street. We must also actively listen to the concerns and feedback of our stakeholders and demonstrate in our actions that their voices are valued and heard. So during our Basin Reference Group Roadshow, we put it to the audience to guide us. We posed questions, real tricky questions, such as, what's of most importance to you? What are you concerned about? Where in the Basin regions are you passionate about, most interested in further information? In the background, we had an almost 150 interconnected PowerPoint slide pack that would then navigate through like a beautiful choose-your-own-adventure book, showcasing the information on a given basin or a science discipline, depending on what the audience wanted to hear, explore, dis discuss, or in some cases, criticise. And we were continually learning and adjusting our approach. We worked with the Basin Reference Group, but we also built on over 10 years of previous geological and environmental programs at this regional scale. We spent a lot of time designing our products to meet the needs of users. And what we ended up coming up with are data guides for each science theme in each basin. They present a snapshot of what is available, how it can be used, why it's important, and where you can get further information. It doesn't slam it all at you like I have today. And through the web page, you can navigate and access the data repository in different ways, depending on whether you are desperately interested in all things groundwater, understandable, or if you would like all multidisciplinary information for a particular basin region. Maybe that's where you live. And we learnt a lot. Now, this slide contains some of these lessons, and they're not all, 
and I don't profess to have all of the answers. I hope I've made it clear that we're still learning as part of this process and the fact that it's only 18 months with which we started to build this repository of information and then try to communicate it. But here are some that I'm, I'm very comfortable sharing with you today. First, the importance of engaging early. For all stakeholders and First Nations peoples, we learned that it is never too early to start understanding the needs of the people within your scientific region of interest. And that by having early conversations, it allows the opportunity to co-design a program, not share what you have planned, but plan together. Co-design is a very popular word at the moment, and a lot of people are using it to show a good intent to bring everybody along on the same journey. When I use the word co-design, I meet it particularly with First Nations people, because we heard very clearly that from the start of the program, to undertake a co-design process, the outputs are going to be more relevant, accessible and meaningful if people have had input from the start. This process also allows the incorporation of traditional knowledge. This program has a weakness that I'm going to share with you today. It only assesses environmental and geological information. There was an assumption made at the start of the program that to map cultural information would be too hard to do well in the time that we had. So a decision was made not to include it at all. Want to know what we didn't do? Pick up the phone to a traditional owner and ask what would actually be involved. We made an assumption. We know theoretically that decision makers want to see cultural considerations, particularly when developments are proposed, so costs and benefits can attempt to be weighed. First Nations people's data sovereignty does need appropriate consideration. But us putting this in the too hard basket was a missed opportunity to break down knowledge hierarchies and produce outputs that incorporate traditional knowledge and acknowledge cultural significance. So, slow down and listen. This is probably the most uh, pervasive feedback and I was lucky enough to go on a cultural immersion program through Geoscience Australia and on the banks of the Catherine River in Waterman country, I also heard this message. Listen, listen, listen. I'm conscious that I've been speaking to you for over half an hour and then telling you the most important thing is to listen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, but as scientists, we have so much to share. And it's sometimes hard to slow down and listen first. But in doing this, it shows respect to our First Nations people and our stakeholders and demonstrates that we value something like a co-design process. And we value the voices other than our own. We build trust and we access new and vast wealth of information. Visit community. You'll remember that I said we ran multiple basin reference group meetings. Well, the first was online, thanks to COVID. The second was hybrid in Brisbane. Both had very good attendance and we were pleased with the outcomes. We were pleased with who, who flew and who logged in and the diversity of, of stakeholders from our various different user groups represented by the race, Basin Reference Group. But when we got to Longreach, Charleville and Rockhampton on our roadshow, and we were receiving some very direct feedback verbally in a small room, they made it very clear that the effort to visit community and have multiple locations that people could choose to, to visit and participate was very much the strong preference. <laughs> And the hybrid version was not our greatest achievement of the program. 
But you know what? Still learning. And what we did in this program won't work for every program, but because we had the privilege of receiving that direct verbal feedback, it would be remiss of me not to share some of, some of it with you today. We learnt little things as well as big things. Preferences, not to be called stakeholders for some of our First Nations Basin Reference Group members. I think the comment was, we're not stakeholders, this is our country. And I think that's a very fair call. There was a strong message to build capacity, not just in science literacy, but in how to access information. For example, local councils. They have to be across a lot of issues at any given time, and they need information they can readily access to respond to the needs of their council areas. A number of comments were made that research and government investment, even in a desktop study, such as the TEGI program, is seen as investment in the region. And this was very welcomed by our Basin Reference Group members. The most meaningful investment that our team took away, and I speak on behalf of us all here, sorry, <laughs> but it's our experience that the importance of investing in relationships was the most important thing of all. Connecting early, consistently, and providing opportunities for discussion, feedback, and tailored education on scientific outputs that continues past the lifetime of a program's funding envelope is, is very valued indeed. So, speaking of scientific outputs, and as we all continue on our journey of stewardship and science advocacy, using earth science to innovate for planet and people. This is where you can go to find further information about the Trusted Environmental and Geological Information Program. Access the data and get in touch for more information. I wish you all a very happy Science Week. Thank you.